Good afternoon and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's Digital Editor. My role today is to introduce you to the platform that we're using and then introduce our topic and our guest before handing over for an excellent hour's worth of presentation and Q&A. Now, the software that we're using is GoToWebinar, and that is where you can ask all the questions that you are inspired to ask throughout the presentation. Now, GoToWebinar can be put anywhere on your screen. You should hopefully already see a uh, screen share that has a slide on it. You should also see a webcam that has my delightful face on it while I'm talking to you. But you should also see the GoToWebinar panel. Now, you can move that about wherever you like. And the most important bit is that there is a box at the bottom that allows you to ask questions. So if you have any questions at any point throughout the webinar, anything that you're inspired to ask, just get them into that questions box and we will make sure that they get put to our speaker at the end of the presentation. So as I said, any question at any point, do get it in there. It doesn't matter whether you think they might have already been covered, maybe you arrived late, get the questions in regardless because it also gives us a fantastic archive of the sorts of questions that get asked that mean that we can make sure that future presentations cover all of the important topics to you, the chemistry community. So let's go to webinar. You may also find, for example, that uh, your audio dips in and out or that you lose the webcams. If you're on a slow connection, feel free to just turn the webcams off. We won't be at all offended and it should mean that you get better quality audio and you can still enjoy the presentation without having to see the cameras and making your computer have to work that a little bit harder. So that's go to webinar and at any point, any questions, just get them in in that questions box at the bottom. We'll be very happy to put them to our speaker. Now, today's topic, the uh, topic of the webinar, developing small molecule degraders using chemoproteomics. So today we're going to learn about using chemoproteomics to inform the development of small molecule degraders. We'll uh, understand how chemoproteomics can be used to annotate the degradable kinome, and this work will fuel kinase degraded discovery and provide a blueprint for evaluating targeted degradation across the entire gene families, which will accelerate future understanding of TPD beyond the kinome. Now, if any of that was unfamiliar, then don't worry, because we have exactly the right person here with us today to talk you through it. So hopefully in the course of the next hour, you will have learned about the challenges of protein degraded discovery. You'll have gained an understanding about using chemoproteomics to annotate the degradable kinome, and you will have increased your understanding of target protein degradation for the kinome and beyond. Now, our guest today, we were put in contact with by Millipore Sigma, who do a great deal of, of really important work on helping people to understand where the, the cutting edges are of scientific research, but also where there are opportunities for collaboration and engagement. And that's why we work with them to find excellent people and excellent speakers uh, about very important, interesting and developing areas of chemical sciences. So thank you ever so much to Millipore Sigma for introducing our guest today. Now, you've heard pretty much enough from me, so I will hand over to Nathaniel Gray. Now, he's the Nancy Lurie Marks Professor of Biological Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology at Harvard Medical School, and also at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where he leads the program in chemical biology. His research centers on drug development and medicinal chemistry related to targeted therapies for cancer, some of which are either in use or undergoing clinical trials at the moment. Nathaniel is now on our screens. Nathaniel, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I will step out of the way and let you get on with your presentation and then come back later for those questions. So thanks again for joining us and thank you everybody uh, who are now uh, still a few people coming in, but I think we've got enough to get started. So thanks again. I'll speak to you again soon. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction and thanks so much for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share our research on developing small molecule degraders using uh, chemoproteomics. So this is my uh, disclosure slide. Uh, these are some uh, companies, biotech companies I'm involved with. Uh, most relevant to this discussion is uh, C4 uh, Therapeutics and also some funding agencies that have funded research uh, in our lab. Most relevant to this talk is funding from Deerfield. So I think the most important slide here in the beginning is to acknowledge some really uh, tremendous people that were uh, involved in this research. All of our work we do collaboratively with uh, Eric Fisher and uh, several talented scientists in his lab, Catherine Donovan, uh, Radoslav Anoak, and then a series of really exceptional scientists in my lab, Ting Hu Zhang, Nick Kajkowski, uh, Jinhua Wang. So what I thought I would do today 
is start off trying to get everyone up to speed on uh, protein degradation and then talk about the, the first system uh, that we worked on in 2015 with Jay Bradner's lab, uh, BRD4, and how we sort of got our, our feet wet with this technology. Then, as the talk is entitled, we'll, we'll talk about the small molecule uh, kinase uh, degraders and how we're characterizing those compounds. Then I'll talk about the DTAG system for protein uh, degradation. And then finally, if I have time, talk about uh, molecular glues uh, and some new directions for uh, protein degradation. So this story starts actually from the convergence of, of two lines of distinct uh, research. Uh, one line uh, investigating the mechanism of an infamous drug uh, called thalidomide, which was uh, discovered many years ago and unfortunately uh, used as a, as a morning sickness uh, medication and led to a huge number of uh, uh, birth defects uh, all over the world uh, before you know, it was discovered that it was really a, a teratogen. But then uh, years later, it was discovered that it actually had miraculous uh, activity in uh, myeloma and has become a, a mainstay uh, myeloma drug. And I think what's amazing about both these stories, um, the horrific story, as well as the, the brilliant story in, in myeloma, is all this work was done in the absence of knowing the molecular mechanism and target of this uh, molecule. Uh, and so to make a longer story uh, short, uh, beautiful work from Hiroshi Honda's lab and others uh, involved uh, the identification of the binding partners of thalidomide using a ligand-based affinity chromatography. So they discovered uh, that this molecule uh, binds an E3 ligase called cerebron in association with another protein called uh, DDB1. Uh, and then through a series of elegant studies from uh, Bill Kalin's lab and Ben Ebert's lab and others, what they found was that these imid molecules, uh, when they bind uh, to cerebron, they actually induce a interaction with key uh, substrates. Uh, in the case of myeloma, the two key substrates are zinc finger transcription factors, one called IKZF1 and one called IKZF3. And when the molecule uh, does that, it actually leads to degradation uh, of those um, uh, targets. Uh, and so while this mechanistic work uh, was ongoing, uh, another parallel line of investigation, uh, independent from them, was led by Ray Deshays and Craig Cruz that essentially were trying to discover uh, a similar mechanism intentionally. Uh, so their idea had been to make intentional uh, bivalent molecules where you link a small molecule, and it's called the degrader, to a ligase. The ligase they primarily worked on initially was VHL, and then a linker, uh, and then a recruiting moiety uh, to your target uh, of interest. And so this discovery of bivalent degruders, which I'm calling uh, these kind of molecules, versus these kind of molecules, which are sometimes called glues, or they're called monovalent uh, degraders, uh, was really sort of catalytic to the field because um, you know, imids were already blockbuster uh, drugs. And so there was not actually a question that this mechanism could be pharmaceutically exploited to make first-in-kind uh, medicines. But now that we sort of understood the rational underpinnings of, of how these kind of molecules work, uh, the question is how do we develop them uh, more efficiently? And just to remind you, this is actually, again, not a, a, a new idea. So for many years, chemists have been inspired by amazing natural products that work as protein-protein interaction uh, inducers. And I have sort of here a, a montage of some of the famous uh, molecules uh, that do this. Perhaps, you know, most famously is uh, this molecule, uh, rapamycin, which acts as a molecular glue to allosterically inhibit uh, mTOR uh, by binding a protein FKBP12 uh, and bringing it in association with the FRB domain of mTOR, and then it allosterically uh, prevents substrates from entering the substrate binding pocket of mTOR and prevents their um, uh, phosphorylation. So there's a lot of work led by Stuart Schreiber and others uh, uh, in the 90s to make what were called chemical uh, inducers of, uh, of dimerization. But I think the, the sort of new insight uh, that's really key from this degrader work is that if one side of your dimerization partner is catalytic, you don't actually need a high affinity interaction induced by the uh, small molecule. Even a small molecule that induces a transient association uh, of the ligase 
can often be a, uh, a good degrader. And that puts a lot less requirements on the level of uh, binding affinity uh, that you might need from such a small molecule. Uh, and so the, the question that we're sort of addressing as a field is what is you know, the best approach for making these uh, the greater molecules? How do you uh, design them? Uh, can you make them uh, rationally? Are there empirical rules to their optimization? Should you use phenotypic screening? Is it better to use bivalent degraders or monovalent degraders? And so some, these are some of the questions that I'll try to address uh, during the lecture. So the first system uh, that we worked on uh, was uh, BRD4. So BRD4 is a very essential chromatin uh, regulator that normally binds uh, acetyl uh, lysine residues on histone proteins and is really key in mediating uh, transcriptional uh, activation of the transcriptional uh, complex. And beautiful work from Jay Bradner's lab had identified a compound, uh, JQ1, that's an acetyl lysine uh, binding compound. And then um, Dennis Buckley and Garrett Winter uh, in, uh, invented this first uh, degrader molecule, a DBET1, or what they did was they linked uh, thalidomide via a linker to this JQ1 molecule. And they got this miraculous result in 2015 that this molecule could induce rapid and efficient degradation of uh, BRD4. So you can see 100 nanomolar uh, compound can lead to rapid uh, degradation of, uh, of BRD4. So one of the key questions is, you know, how does this degradation pharmacology differ from traditional uh, pharmacology, right? So in traditional pharmacology, you're very concerned with having a high residence time of your ligand because you want to fully occupy uh, your binding site to block its function. Typically, you're binding in some kind of a catalytic pocket, and typically you're an inhibitor, although obviously there are allosteric activators. But your drug concentration really helps control your pharmacodynamics because you need to maintain that uh, target suppression. Now, this is fundamentally different uh, from these degraders where you know, we're calling it sort of event-driven uh, pharmacology. And so essentially, uh, the molecule is acting as a catalyst uh, for degradation. And so the name of the game is not getting you know, long-term stable ternary complex formation. What you want to do is stabilize the transition state uh, for ubiquitylation to happen most efficiently on your uh, target protein. And then once you've done that, your pharmacodynamics is controlled by the protein uh, resynthesis rate, very much like for a covalent inhibitor. So essentially, once you get full degradation, then the you know, biological system will uh, reset only when new protein gets um, uh, synthesized. And then, of course, another fundamental difference is these types of occupancy-based inhibitors will typically only block the function of a particular uh, domain of the protein, whereas these kind of molecules will degrade the entire protein, uh, the entire polypeptide chain that's linked to that domain. So, for example, you can grab onto one domain, and if you've got a massive protein, everything else gets uh, degraded. And so the pharmacology that you might see from inhibition versus degradation could be fundamentally uh, different. So when you start thinking about um, making these molecules, there's a whole set of unique questions that you have that you don't traditionally have with a uh, conventional inhibitor. And so because these molecules are trying to induce ternary complex formation between your target of interest and the E3, you have to develop specific biochemical assays to look at target binding, to look at ligase binding, and then also importantly, to look at ternary uh, complex formation, because you need uh, the ternary complex form to form in order to get efficient ubiquitin uh, transfer. One critique of this field early on, when you show these molecules to a medicinal chemist, is you know they will say you know these are ugly uh, molecules, they're too big, they don't obey uh, Lipinski's uh, guidelines, and one of the reasons you can get away with these uh, large molecules is because they can work at very low uh, cellular concentrations, right? And this goes back, again, to their mechanism. You don't need to get uh, full, stable uh, complexation with the target. Transient interaction is enough. That being said, many of these compounds are a hair's breadth away from not being uh, cell penetrant. 
And so it's very useful to develop assays to measure uh, to what degree you do get target engagement and to what degree you do get uh, cell penetration. Then you need to develop assays uh, to look at uh, target degradation. So, you know, the most conventional and primitive way of, of doing this is by uh, the age old technique of uh, Western broadening. But now there's a lot of interesting technologies uh, involving uh, various fluorescent uh, fusion proteins or a beautiful system uh, developed by Promega, this uh, high bit uh, system that can be used to efficiently look at degradation. Because ideally, you want a system that allows you to look at many inhibitor concentrations and many uh, time points efficiently to be able to screen uh, many compounds. Then you want to look at the duration of uh, target degradation. So the compound you know, does not affect the endogenous rate of, of protein uh, production. So you want to ask, you know, after you degrade your protein, uh, how long does it take the protein to be resynthesized and restored to the cell? Because a protein that has a very fast resynthesis rate may not be as exciting as a target for degradation as something that has a slower uh, recuperation rate. Then it's really critical to look at the ability to degrade in different um, uh, model systems. Uh, so, for example, one reason thalidomide was given to pregnant women was it was thought to be a very uh, safe compound. And in fact, in mice, uh, you can dose to incredibly high levels and you'll never see uh, teratogenicity. And that's because there can be species differences in the ability of these compounds to degrade. And one reason there can be species differences is that the protein-protein interface uh, between uh, the ligase and the target can be different in different species. And so in the case of thalidomide, there's a mutation uh, or you know, a difference in mouse cerebron uh, versus human cerebron, which prevents it from degrading uh, some of the substrates involved in the teratogenicity effect. And so you really need to evaluate your degraders uh, in the cell type uh, ultimately that's going to be used if you're going to do mice or you're going to do another uh, animal species for uh, testing. Then, of course, you need to establish uh, whether the compound has any uh, bioavailability in vivo and whether you can get uh, degradation of the target. Again, one reason these molecules uh, can you know, look very non-drug-like is vanishingly small concentrations can actually still lead to degradation. We have several examples where we can't even monitor the concentration of the drug. It's below our, our bioanalytical technique, but despite that, we see degradation of the target. So these again are enumerating some of the, the key differences where you can uh, have advantages or disadvantages with uh, degraders. So you can get unique and high uh, target selectivity. And as I'll show in a moment, this comes about because you can get selectivity uh, from the protein-protein interface. Because you don't have to have full uh, ligand occupancy to have uh, potency, you have the ability sometimes to overcome point mutation uh, based resistance. You also have unique uh, opportunities in, uh, in polypharmacology. So you can intentionally make degraders that will degrade uh, several proteins or an entire uh, set of you know, uh, orthologs uh, of different targets uh, to achieve uh, pharmacological effects that you might not with an inhibitor. The other point here is that there are many targets that are typically uh, undruggable because they don't have a ligand uh, binding pocket. But because the way these compounds work is by inducing a protein-protein interface, you can sometimes have a degrader that purely binds uh, to one of the partners, either the target or the ligase, uh, and then allosterically induce a protein-protein interaction. And so the actual uh, interface that's being targeted doesn't need to be conventionally druggable. And a perfect example of that are the original IKCF1 and 3 uh, targets, which you know, were previously considered undruggable uh, transcription factors. And then the final point is that the degraders can have a very differentiated uh, PK-PD uh, profile uh, because the degradation uh, event uncouples the need for continual drug exposure uh, relative to when you're seeing your pharmacodynamic effect. So let me give some recent highlights of the BRD4 uh, stories. We started working with uh, Eric Fisher's lab uh, to try to understand the molecular basis for how these degrader molecules interact with their uh, targets. And so what I'm showing you here is a ternary complex formed between the ligase. So in this case, the ligase has two uh, components, cerebron, the C-terminal domain, the M-terminal domain. It has this cofactor protein, a DDD1 down here in yellow. 
And then at the top is where uh, BRD4 binds. And if you strain your eyes, you can see in the middle here, this little um, piece of spaghetti here is the molecule. So there's a portion of the molecule that binds to cerebron. Then there's this linker element going up into BRD4 where JQ1 binds. And the most salient thing to see from the slide is this molecule is inducing a large new protein-protein interaction. So really the molecule's job is to induce this new protein-protein uh, uh, interface. And that gives you the really interesting possibility that depending on how that interface is made can get you uh, selectivity. So to exemplify this, here's two different molecules uh, that were crystallized. One, one small molecule is called DBET57, the other one is DBET23, and what they induce is very different protein-protein uh, interactions. And so one molecule induces this yellow conformation, and the other molecule induces this purple uh, conformation. And so that means that the molecule, the small molecule, is controlling the disposition of the two proteins and inducing a very different protein-protein interface in the two situations. So this brings about this question, can you use the protein-protein interface to give you a molecular selectivity? And like many um, proteins, they come in, in families and the bromodomains are no different. So there's BRD2, 3, and 4, and then BRDT expressed in the testes. And it's been very hard to get uh, selectivity purely from the ligand um, uh, binding site. The acetyl-lysine binding pocket of these four enzymes or four proteins is quite uh, similar. So we started undertaking uh, an examination of how we could control the interaction of these two proteins in different uh, conformations. And we used this beautiful software uh, developed by uh, Rosetta, which is typically used for looking at protein-protein interfaces, to try to predict uh, how we could uh, connect these two segments. And so there's a segment here, uh, JQ1 binding to BRD4, and then this ligand binding pocket. And then you can look at the different poses uh, that are formed to inform how to connect uh, these two molecules. You know, how many atoms spacer, you know, how rigid, does it need a kink, does it need to go to the left, does it need to go to the right? And by doing that, you might be able to favor a conformation of, that allows uh, one protein-protein interaction but disallows another protein-protein uh, interaction. And Zishang in the lab was successful in doing this, and he made this compound, uh, ZXH2147, that only allowed BRD4 to dock well onto cerebron, but not the other uh, bromo domains. And this is how we evaluated it. You can see here this uh, selective degrader selectively degrades BRD4, but leaves BRD2 and 3 alone, where the original compound that had been published a number of years earlier, DBET6, can degrade BRD4. Uh, two and three. So again, here I'm showing you how you evaluate these compounds by uh, fluorescent imaging, western blotting, uh, or you can use a, a hybrid uh, type system. The other thing you'll notice from these slides is that these molecules show this classic uh, hook uh, behavior, and so you have a sweet spot where you're inducing ternary complex formation, you get degradation, but if you get to too high a concentration, the degrader molecule uh, stops working, and this is, you know, an expected behavior for molecules that have to induce a ternary uh, complex to form uh, uh, their activity. The other amazing uh, technology that's really enabling for degraders is uh, proteomics. Uh, and I won't go through the, the details of this methodology, but essentially you're able to look at uh, several uh, thousand proteins by quantitative uh, mass spectrometry and evaluate which ones get uh, downregulated. And so you'll see several of these plots uh, throughout the talk where on the x-axis, we're plotting a, a p-value for the degree of, of confidence in that degree of downregulation, and then a log uh, fold change. So you can see this degrader really selectively uh, degraded BRD4 versus several other proteins that were much more marginally uh, downregulated. And so this is a great way to assess globally in a cell type of interest uh, what proteins are being uh, degraded. The other thing that we we're able to achieve with these degraders is that we could show that we could degrade uh, chromosomal uh, fusion proteins, which was actually the original motivation for working on BRD4. So there's a very uh, potent oncogene that's formed when BRD4 gets fused with NUT in a very aggressive cancer called NUT midline uh, carcinoma. And what I'm showing you here is that the selective BRD4 degrader can degrade BRD NUT 
uh, with the same efficiency as uh, as DBET six. And so one area that we're hoping to uh, develop more in the future is can you actually make degraders that are specific uh, for the fusion protein? So for example, ones that could degrade BRD nut, but that would not degrade a uh, normal uh, wild type uh, BRD4. And we think that should be uh, possible. And if it is, it will open a really exciting area to degrade uh, oncogenic fusions, of which there are, are many that are currently undruggable. Okay, so in the next section, let me talk about our experience making a small molecule uh, kinase uh, degraders. And so after the success of the BRD4 degraders, we were you know, bolstered in our confidence that many targets would be easy uh, to degrade. But of course, the reality of science is uh, nothing is, is general and nothing is easy. So we started uh, looking uh, at the kinone family because this family has obviously been massively successful uh, for drug discovery. The slide is now a little bit old. There's probably over 50 approved uh, kinase inhibitors targeting um, a, a small swath of the uh, kinone. But we thought if we could develop uh, kinase degraders, we might be able to address kinases that are currently undruggable or kinases that require loss of scaffolding function uh, to see their activity. So for example, there are 80 or so uh, pseudokinases, and we were very interested to see if we could degrade uh, some of those. And the first one we wanted to work on was one of the most credentialed pseudokinases called HER3, which is a member of the EGFR uh, kinase family that, that has EGFR, uh, HER2, HER3, and HER4. So HER3, is an obligate heterodimerization partner uh, with EGFR and with HER2, but it hasn't typically been drugged because it's catalytically uh, inactive. That's why it's classified as a pseudokinase. But people have developed very good uh, antibodies that either prevent uh, dimerization of HER3 at the, at the extracellular surface or sequester ligand uh, from binding to uh, prevent the, the dimerization. But nobody had really pharmacologically tried to make inhibitors uh, of HER3. And so we embarked on that and we had a paper in 2014 where we made the first covalent selective binders of HER3 that form a unique uh, uh, um, covalent bond with cysteine uh, 721. And as expected, uh, this being a pseudokinase, these compounds had absolutely no effect on HER3 uh, dependent signaling. So you can you know, jam up the ATP site of HER3 and the enzyme uh, doesn't really care. It can still dimerize with uh, EGFR and HER2. But we thought this would be, provide a great platform uh, for making uh, degraders. And so we then made degraders, bivalent protac-based degraders from these two molecules that unfortunately failed to degrade HER3 uh, entirely. And so we were very depressed by this uh, experience, but we decided then to take a step back and ask, you know, can we annotate, you know, what kinases are more easily degraded rather than try to approach it uh, rationally uh, each time. And so, uh, again, in, in collaboration with Eric's lab in the study led by um, Hubert, we intentionally tried to make very promiscuous uh, kinase degraders. And so uh, this study published in, in 2018, where we took this uh, diamino uh, pyrimidine, uh, an analog of a, of a compound called TAE684, uh, where we intentionally uh, linked it via linker uh, to Cerebron. And we specifically wanted this kinase inhibitor because, as you can see here from this map, this shows all the kinases that uh, it binds to. It binds to hundreds of kinases. And then we surveyed using chemoproteomics how many kinases are, uh, are degraded. And in this initial study, we found about 20 kin 28 kinases uh, that could be degraded despite more than 200 kinases or almost about 200 kinases being bound. And it made sense that the number of targets degraded was less than the number bound because to be degraded, you know, more things have to happen you know, correctly, right? So you've got to get the ternary complex form, you've got to get ubiquitylation, ubiquitylation has to lead to degradation, and then you have to be able to detect that by, by mass uh, spectrometry. So of course we knew that this is not the, the total number of kinases that could be degraded, and so we decided to expand uh, this study. So now this is some uh, work hopefully that's soon to be uh, published, where we built out a library of over uh, 60 uh, compounds that spanned a whole range of compounds, uh, type 1 kinase inhibitors, 
uh, type 2 kinase inhibitors, uh, and primarily we link them either to uh, cerebellum recruiting uh, ligands like these imids or uh, VHL uh, recruiting um, uh, ligands. And then we performed a large number of uh, proteomic experiments to basically generate this giant matrix where across the um, uh, x-axis here, uh, we have all the inhibitors, and down here along the y-axis, we have all the, uh, the kinases uh, being degraded. And so we're going to actually uh, have a, a publicly accessible uh, database where you can go in and look up uh, your favorite uh, kinase and find out you know, which compounds, whether it was degraded and which compounds degraded it, or you can do the, the chemocentric approach and start with a molecule and then ask you know, what things get uh, degraded. And we've learned a lot of things by doing this large-scale experiment that I think we never would have learned uh, at one at a time or we would have learned uh, you know, much more uh, slowly. So one you know, really amazing finding from the study is that some very promiscuous binders end up being incredibly uh, you know, selective degraders. So for example, uh, this compound, uh, those of you who are kinase aficionados will recognize this as being a disatinib, a very potent uh, SARC family inhibitor uh, originally uh, developed by BMS. Uh, we linked up to a Cerebron uh, recruiter. This compound ended up being a very selective degrader of C-terminal um, uh, SART kinase, uh, despite being able to bind to many other uh, kinases. And so very often a, a quite promiscuous uh, kinase ligand can turn into a, a very uh, you know, selective degrader. We also learned that there are uh, some kinases that are clearly much more easily degraded by uh, protac uh, type degraders uh, than others. And we learned you know, some of the factors uh, that go into those um, uh, differences. So now we have about uh, uh, 120 to 180, depending on how you do the quantification, uh, kinases that can be degraded. Again, we don't think this is exhaustive, but we have a, a, a very you know, strong distribution of, of things that are more easily degraded uh, to more uh, difficult to be degraded. We see uh, an enrichment uh, for a lot of kinases, for example, that are, are, are cell cycle regulated. So we do think uh, there are some factors related to whether the target is, is normally uh, rapidly degraded at a certain um, cell cycle stage or through a certain signaling event that might um, prime things for uh, degradation. But we also see kinases that uh, are not known to be you know, rapidly degraded, but can be artificially uh, rapidly degraded with a, uh, with a protact. We then uh, embarked on an experiment where we took the four most promiscuous uh, degraders um, uh, from the library and uh, applied them across a larger number uh, of experiments uh, to ask some uh, basic questions about what makes things more or less uh, degradable. And so one question relates to how binding uh, relates to uh, degradation. And so what I'm showing you here are correlation plots where we measured kinase target engagement by doing this um, uh, kinative uh, binding assay. So that's along here, the x-axis. So things over here on the right are highly bound. And then the y-axis is, uh, is, is degradation. And so as you might expect, there are things that are highly bound uh, that, are, that are well degraded, but there are also targets that are quite, um, quite we reasonably degraded that aren't bound uh, very well. And so this is partly where this uh, selectivity uh, comes from. Sometimes some fairly weak uh, kinase binders end up being very effective at degrading uh, certain uh, kinase targets simply because they're more efficient catalysts for their uh, destruction. And so the reason this chemoproteomic approach is so uh, enabling is you can't simply you know, choose your scaffold of interest based on known binding affinity to a given uh, kinase. Oftentimes, uh, number 30 kinase in terms of binding affinity will be the one that's the most easily uh, degraded. So really doing this empirical uh, proteomic approach uh, allows you to figure out what's efficiently degraded. And then as you can see, uh, these were intentionally chosen. You know, these compounds are like, you know, machine guns for uh, eliminating uh, specific proteins. I mean, they just cause, you know, massive degradation 
uh, of a whole series of, of kinase targets. We also see big differences if you look in different um, cell types, and this is both a, a promising and a scary part of these uh, degrader molecules. You know, they uh, have you know very different profiles in different uh, cell types, and so when you you know say a compound is is selective, you really have to qualify that uh, with a, a statement of where where you've looked. And you know, in terms of toxicology, I think there can be some real surprises that you may uh, see. Where you get, uh, you know, degraders in particular um, particular contexts. We also saw real differences depending on which ligase uh, was recruited. So in general, things can be well degraded, you know, with both ligase recruitments. So here along the x-axis, I'm showing a DHL-based recruiting kinase inhibitor, and along the y-axis, I'm showing a serblon. So you can see most compounds lie along the diagonal, but then you'll find profiles like this. Where you can see there's a whole bunch of kinases here in this upper uh, left-hand quadrant that are, you know, more efficiently degraded by recruitment of one ligase versus another, and that makes sense again because some proteins are better matched to the protein-protein interface formed by one ligase uh, versus another. And so, one very exciting area in in degradation pharmacology now is trying to find uh, additional uh, ligases that might allow you to uh, degrade something that Cerebron or VHL uh, couldn't, or for example, that might show a, a context-specific uh, degradation event. So for example, uh, maybe the, the degradation will only happen when a ligase is activated in a certain fashion to give you an additional degree of, of pharmacological control over where you see that uh, degradation event. So then how do you, how do you take that proteomic data and you know, make the graders for your, your favorite uh, kinase. And so one kinase we and other groups started working on is uh, BTK. So this is a validated target in a variety of B cell uh, tumors. And we had noticed from the chemoproteomics that BTK was extremely well degraded by many of the multi-targeted uh, degraders. And right now, there's a number of drugs that have been approved as BTK inhibitors, and one of them is this uh, famous compound called Ibrutinib, which is a covalent cysteine-41-directed uh, uh, inhibitor. And so we thought this would also be a great uh, test case for figuring out whether a degrader would be a superior agent against a resistance mutation. Because as you can imagine, if this cysteine becomes mutated, a drug like abrutinib will no longer be uh, effective because it can't form a, uh, a covalent bond. So Dennis in the lab uh, endeavored to make a, a series of uh, BTK degraders, and other chemists had already done all the hard work for us of making you know beautiful selective uh, high affinity uh, BTK binders. And so we made um, uh, this compound, which was a active BTK binder. You can see here from the kinome profile, and it's exceptionally uh, selective. We do a lot of work with molecular modeling to sort of figure out that we've gotten the right sort of connection segment between the, the BTK binding moiety here, uh, shown in blue, and then how it docks down with, uh, with Cerebron. And then we're often, um, to assess what part of the pharmacology is degradation dependent, we'll often make a pair of compounds where we disable the Cerebron binding, either through methylation of the glutaramide or will eliminate one of these um, uh, carbonyl groups. And so that's very important. So you can basically ask how much of your pharmacology comes from uh, degradation versus how much comes from inhibition. Because remember, we have, you know, we have an active kinase binder here. And so you can have the possibility for both conventional inhibition together with, um, with degradation. And then as I mentioned, many of these compounds have hopeless cell permeability. So it's very useful to have a Cerebron uh, or VHL, you know, engagement assay to ascertain, you know, is, is the problem with your compound, you know, whether it can get into cells or not. As you can see, this uh, DD0307 was a very effective um, uh, BTK degrader already after two hours, you almost have complete uh, degradation. And then we we'll often uh, validate that this degradation is proteasome dependent, also dependent on, on a nettylation event that's required. Uh, and then you can compete away the degradation either by blocking the E3 ligase or by blocking uh, BTK. And so those are our typical controls that we run 
to show uh, that the degradation is happening through the anticipated mechanism. Because sometimes degradation can be induced by, you know, hitting a chaperone protein or blocking, you know, protein resynthesis. So it's very important to, you know, make sure that actually the, the protac type mechanism is at play. Because this compound that we made was a non-covalent um, degrader, we actually have equal ability to degrade both wild-type BTK as well as the cysteine 41 serine mutation that confers resistance to abrutinib. So this really shows that um, you can overcome a point mutation, which is a, a lethal uh, blow to a covalent inhibitor, but with the degrader, which doesn't require that full occupancy, you can get effective uh, activity. And in collaboration, again, with Eric's lab, we're able to show that we can get, you know, very selective degradation uh, for BTK. And then depending on how you make your protac, you can either have ones that maintain activity against the zinc finger proteins, or you can engineer it out in other uh, compounds. And this comes back to the desire or the non-desire to have polypharmacology. Uh, because you could imagine in a, in a B cell dependent tumor, being able to degrade a kinase target of interest like BTK or FLT3 uh, together, you know, with a lineage dependency factor like IKCF1 and 3 could give you uh, a, a more potent polypharmacological effect than a purely selective um, kinase inhibitor. We then collaborated with David uh, Weinstock's lab to evaluate these compounds in a, in a mouse model of mantle cell lymphoma. So in this case, we took uh, human uh, cells and, and transplanted them into a um, mouse, and we can compare the efficacy uh, of these compounds compared to um, ibrutinib and lenalidomide. And what you can see is that we got, you know, really impressive uh, survival of prolongation of, uh, of um, survival, and we could very effectively uh, degrade uh, BTK. And again, this is with just a, a tool compound where we didn't do any significant, you know, medicinal chemistry effort uh, to improve the properties of this compound. And so I think the, the chances of getting a, a really uh, impressive development grade BTK inhibitor or degrader, you know, certainly would be possible with a more professional uh, chemistry effort. So what about, you know, uh, selectivity? So we saw a lot of this interesting selectivity from our um, proteomics profiling, but can we sort of engineer that uh, you know, intentionally. So Aishan in the lab took on this uh, challenge with a, a compound from uh, Pfizer that's now uh, very widely used uh, to treat breast cancer, uh, palbocyclib. So palbocyclib is a dual inhibitor of CDK4 and 6. I think there's only one amino acid difference between the active site of CDK4 and CDK6. And so you get potent inhibition of both uh, kinases. And so he made bivalent degraders, this 123 compound, as well as a negative control, again, methylation on the glutaramid, these two molecules mimic the binding activity of palbocyclib, so they're equipotent inhibitors of CDK4 and CDK6, but he made the really surprising discovery that this compound is really selective for uh, CDK6. So you can see it, it, you know, completely degrades CDK6 and leaves CDK4 alone, the negative control with the methylated glutaramid uh, doesn't degrade. This is confirmed uh, by mass spectrometry, so you can see selective degradation of uh, CDK6. And then we use this really nice assay, uh, originally developed by Promega, to look at why there is this selectivity. And so what we've done here is we have this uh, split uh, luciferase system where the molecule, when it induces ternary complex formation, reassembles the large bit and the small bit, and you get light emission. And so you can see the basis of the selectivity of this molecule comes about because of successful ternary uh, complex formation. The compound can form the ternary complex for CDK6. It can't do that for uh, CDK4. And that's simply because the protein-protein interface is compatible for CDK6, uh, but not for CDK4. Uh, so now, you know, us and, and a number of labs have started making, you know, kinase degraders for, you know, all at least of the pharmacologically validated uh, kinase targets with ALK and EGFR and, and CDKs. And I think we're going to see many of these compounds uh, being evaluated, at least preclinically, uh, to figure out if they have uh, advantageous profiles relative to conventional uh, kinase inhibitors. Now, of course, 
you know, these compounds will have all sorts of issues uh, of their own. Uh, one of them, of course, being uh, resistance. And so, you know, while I showed the ability to overcome resistance in the case of uh, BTK, for other kinases, uh, you can get resistance, for example, by losing expression of the uh, of the ligase. And so, the the level of ligase expression it's critical for these compounds to work. And it's already known uh, from the clinic and myeloma that if you start having cerebellum uh, being epigenetically uh, silenced, then imid imid drugs will will stop uh, working. And we've confirmed the same phenomena can happen with uh, kinase uh, degraders. Also, because you need this successful ternary complex formation, you can get mutations not in the drug binding site, but you can get mutations of the protein-protein um, uh, interface, which can also give you resistance. So, of course, like any targeted therapy, uh, the uh, cancer cells can eventually evolve uh, resistance. But I think the good news is the type of resistance that you see can be orthogonal to the type of resistance that you see with uh, conventional inhibitors. And so that you know, leads to the exciting possibility that you might have combination strategies where you can use a traditional orthosteric occupancy-based inhibitor. And then if you have a degrader on board uh, as well, you can basically eliminate the target in, in two different ways and, and possibly have it, have it be much harder for resistance to evolve. So these are some general uh, lessons you know, we have from this uh, chemo uh, proteomic approach. We think this is a great way to go after new gene families of interest. So if you want to find out the degradability of methyltransferases or dehydrogenases or serine hydrolases, this could be a great way of uh, annotating uh, how easily or difficult it is to degrade uh, those targets. We've also extended uh, degraders to uh, viral uh, targets, which I think is front and center in everybody's mind uh, currently. And so in a nice proof of concept study that we did with Priscilla Yang's lab, we took uh, telapavir, a well-established HCV protease inhibitor, and effectively uh, made a, a degrader. And again, like in the case of BTK, we showed that the telapavir-based degrader is less subject to the permutation-based resistance than the uh, parental uh, compound. I think there's a real exciting area in the future for developing uh, antiviral degraders, not only uh, degraders of virally encoded proteins, but also of host factors uh, that are essential for uh, viral replication. So I think this will be an exciting area that we'll see uh, develop in the next couple of years. We've also shown that you can degrade uh, really challenging targets uh, like tau. So this is, you know, a, a classically uh, undruggable uh, target. So tau uh, can form uh, various aggregates in different apathies and various neurodegenerative uh, disorders. And so uh, Kwang Kai and Floor Ferguson in the lab built uh, tau degraders. So we exploited some very nice ligands made by others that were pet probes. And so people had screened for compounds that selectively bind uh, tau, and they'd made these radio tracer F18 labeled uh, compounds. So we simply adopted those compounds and made uh, cerebellum based degraders. And then in collaboration with um, the Haggerty's lab, using these IPS induced uh, neuronal cultures, we could show that we could very effectively degrade uh, tau. So here's one compound at one micromolar degrading tau. Uh, A152T. Here's another tau pathogenic mutant, uh, P301L. And interestingly, these compounds are actually mutant uh, specific. So you can see they're degrading mutant tau. Over here, I have the healthy uh, control neurons. You can see they're actually not degrading uh, the normal uh, tau. And that's partly because of the selectivity of the ligands, but it's also because the homeostasis of tau when it's mutant and when it's uh, wild type is actually uh, uh, quite different. So I think degraders have huge promise in, in targeting undruggable uh, proteins in, in neurodegeneration uh, and even showing uh, selectivity uh, for pathogenic uh, forms. All right, let me switch uh, gears here and uh, talk quickly about the, the DTAG uh, system, and then I'll, I'll try to get into the, um, the molecular glues in the last five minutes. So the, the DTAG system is essentially a system for making a degrader of your uh, protein of interest or degrading your protein of interest if you don't have a, you know, a small molecule and if, if your primary goal is just to establish biologically what happens if you degrade the target. And so essentially what Benam Nabet uh, in the lab did 
whereas generate a system will refuse a tag, and we use the um, Newton form of FKBP, use it to your target of interest, and then use a single compound to degrade the tag. But because the tag is covalently linked to your target of interest, the entire thing gets um, uh, degraded. And so the major advantage of this is you can achieve much faster degradation of your target than you can achieve by you know any of the SH or CRISPR uh, based methods. So you know within 10 or 20 minutes you can totally degrade your target and then look at very fast uh, um, things. So you know, look at effects on transcription, look at effects on signaling, on, on phosphorylation, and we've made this system you know widely uh, available uh, to a number of of labs. I'm just going to show what that looks like. We've got the vectors. Um, Available, you can you can basically either get the, the molecules from us with an MTA or you can uh, buy them from any number of, of vendors. And then all the plasmids for creating these FKB fusions and for doing the gateway cloning and for doing the introduction of them into your cell type of interest can be gotten from uh, AdGene. So this has really been a, a great system for uh, degrading targets uh, and then studying what the, what the biological effect is. So let me switch now at the very end to talk about you know, molecular uh, glues. So we've talked about uh, bivalent uh, degraders where you're intentionally bridging uh, the two uh, targets, but we we're interested in whether uh, other image uh, type glue molecules could be uh, identified. And so there's this beautiful paper um, uh, published by Dupanjan at um, uh, UT Southwestern where they characterized a molecule uh, called uh, indusilin. That's this uh, little red square that seem to be working analogously to an imid. In this case, instead of binding to cerebron, it bound to a different uh, ligase, DCAF15, and degraded a protein called RBM39. Uh, but when this paper was published, though, the structural underpinnings of what was happening here was a little bit um, uh, unclear. And so we endeavored to try to figure out you know, if the mechanism, you know, really was analogous to the thalidomide story or if it was quite um, uh, different. And so we developed biochemical assays. We're looking at engagement of this compound with uh, DCAF15. And then Eric's lab was able to get a uh, crystal structure, which actually showed that the molecule binds, you know, very deeply in a cleft in uh, DCAF15 and has limited interactions with um, RBM39, but induces actually a very, very large complex surface um, uh, with uh, RBM39. Uh, and so here's looking at it in, uh, in more detail. Here's the, uh, the compound binding. Here's uh, RBM39. Uh, and so the fundamental difference with the imid based system is it's a much larger 13 protein interface uh, that's uh, formed. I think I have a slide to show them, I don't. So basically, if you compare this with the um, uh, the protein protein interface formed with an imid, it's a much more limited uh, interface. And so we then asked, could we expand out uh, the types of, of ligands to explore a bigger um, uh, chemical space? Because that's been successfully done for, for imids. And so for imids, you can make various versions of thalidomide, which degrade a variety of neo substrates. So these are some of the ones that have been published, IKZF1 and 3, a whole series of other IKZFs, casein kinase, SAL4, which is believed to be the teratogenicity target, uh, GSPT1, and some other uh, zinc finger uh, proteins. And so what we tried to do with the sulfonamides was build out a, a library of compounds to find out what else could be degraded. And we actually made the surprising discovery that actually only a limited number of substrates uh, could be degraded. And that's because in that case, you know, the protein-protein the interface is much more dominant over the small molecule uh, protein uh, interface. And so that ligase seems to be actually a lot more, a lot less plastic in its ability to be, uh, to be re-engineered. We've extended this now to uh, IMIDs. And so we've recently published a, a study where we built a, a combinatorial a uh, library of imids and then use this proteomic profiling to look at um, uh, selectivity. And we, for example, show here that we could get novel degraders of uh, GSPT1 
that look you know quite different from your conventional uh, image. Uh, here's the library that I just mentioned that we built on the Indo, uh, Indosalim uh, type compounds. And again, despite profiling many compounds, we only expanded the number of substrates by uh, an order of two. Uh, so you know the RBM39 was the original one, and then RBM23. And so we've so far been, I'd say, not so successful at really expanding the repertoire of this particular uh, ligase. Uh, but now with the available crystal structure, uh, we might uh, we might have some more um, you know success. So here's you know what you see with imids, really a lot of versatility in terms of the neo substrates you can degrade. Here's the case of RBM39, uh, much more uh, limited. Here again is the protein protein uh, interface, very large for decaf 15, more limited for uh, cerebron. And so a lot of people in the field now are thinking about the relative merits of making you know, bivalent degraders, where you have the advantage that you can use uh, known binders uh, and sort of more modular versus these glue type approaches, which have the advantage that often you're working on a protein protein interface for which you don't have any uh, binding ligand and might take you into uh, more you know, classically undruggable uh, targets, but currently we don't have as rational a way of finding those types of uh, compounds. So let me stop there and, and thank some really uh, incredible investigators. As I mentioned, we do all this in, in close partnership with Eric Fisher's lab. Uh, Benam Nabet was our, the brains behind the, the, the um, DTAG uh, system. And Roddick has been really key in figuring out uh, how to implement a lot of the biochemical assays that make the greater work uh, possible. Uh, so I'll uh, stop there and be happy to take some questions. Thank you ever so much for what has been a, a, a very powerful overview of an area that clearly has enormous potential and, and across a wide variety of different disease models as well. So thank you for that. There's a great deal to pack in uh, to the last hour or so, and, uh, and people have got some questions. In particular, Frank, I've got to say thank you for all of your excellent questions. I think what I'll do, Frank, if it's all right with you, is pass your details on to Nathaniel and you can have a, a long in-depth discussion uh, as clearly uh, you know a great deal more about this than I do, and I'm sure you and Nathaniel can get a, a lot of mileage out of that. Uh, but first of all, one thing that you mentioned earlier is alluded to in one of Frank's questions as well. You talked about the uh, cellular environment or different cellular environments being key. Um, does that mean that it would be possible to have protax that can target uh, targets <laughs> in specific tissues, for example? So when we're looking to target a tumor, for example, if we know it is in particular in nerve cells, can we develop that? No, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a, a combination of selectivity that comes from, you know, the usual differences in, in, uh, in biodistribution. And, you know, one of the peculiarities of degraders is because, you know, they're such big and often ugly molecules, at least the, the bivalent ones, you know, the degree of saturation that you get of all the tissues can be quite uh, different. So, you know, you can get differences just because of drug bioavailability, but then you can also get differences, you know, not necessarily because of, you know, ligase expression, although maybe one day that, that'll be uh, possible, but just in the ability to get ternary complex formation and for that lead to lead to degradation. As I didn't talk so much, you know, most of these ubiquitylation events are counteracted by ubiquitylation events catalyzed by the dub family of, uh, of enzymes. And so how that protein homeostasis rheostat is set in different tissues can be quite uh, different. And so, for example, if you just take your, your favorite bivalent degrader and you analyze your extent of degradation across different tissues, uh, you'll see some very big uh, differences. So I, I don't know of a published example where people have really demonstrated that to be uh, beneficial, uh, where they could really, you know, for example, degrade something that is permissive uh, toxicologically wise, you know, in kidney and avoid degradation in the liver. But I, I definitely see that as the in the realm of, of possibility for the future. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so let's, seeing as Frank has asked so many great questions, let's take, uh, I think we'll probably only have time for one, maybe two, Frank. 
this is a nice broad one from fairly early on in the presentation. Is it possible to predict whether a protein may be a suitable substrate for a protac approach? So I think a, a priori, you know, no. I mean, I think that the general assumption going in is if you have a, a, a decent binding ligand, the, the chance of making it a greater is, is, is pretty high. I've been trying to encourage everybody in the community to publish their, their failed examples because, you know, as usual, we're getting a massively skewed uh, rendition. Everyone talks about what, what works and what doesn't work. So it would be great to have a journal of failed um, uh, protax, and there are many of them. The problem is, in our experience, sometimes you, you fail because you didn't uh, you know, try uh, hard enough. So for example, JAK2 is a great um, therapeutic target. You know, we made 15 compounds, nothing worked. You know, someone, another group now you know, made several hundred and found one that works. So sometimes it's very peculiar. You just have to make exactly the right uh, you know, molecule. Uh, but there are other targets where it's been, you know, exceptionally difficult, and people have also seen uh, compartment-specific uh, degradation. So, for example, the protein might live in a complex that's permissive in the cytoplasm, but live in a different complex in the nucleus, and you can't degrade the nuclear form of the uh, of the enzyme because of an inability to form the, the ternary complex. Uh, a follow-up to that as well. D did you identify any particular themes from using the promiscuous inhibitors you were talking about earlier that would then help you to make those sorts of, uh, of a priori predictions? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I, I would say for for forward prediction, I, I I still think you have to you have to keep doing the you know the proteomic experiment. I think once you you know once you know a, a, a target is, is well degraded by a promiscuous degrader, uh, then we've had, you know, an extremely high hit rate of then making a more, uh, you know, selective uh, degrader. So, you know, so once you catch the fish one time, you can catch it, a, you know, a second time. But in terms of, of then extrapolating to something you've never caught before, I think it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite difficult. You know, there's a lot of discussion in the literature about how predictive, you know, ternary complex formation is. And clearly, you know, the mechanism requires formation of a ternary complex, but we've seen cases of degradation where, you know, we can barely detect the, the ternary uh, complex. So I think that, again, you know, makes sense from a, from a catalysis point of view. If you set up the uh, complex perfectly, even if you've got a really transient interaction, if it's catalytically, you know, extremely competent, you know, that can still be, uh, that can still be good, uh, you know, enough. But, I still think it ends up being quite a, um, you know, empirical uh, exercise. One of the exciting tidbits that you uh, dropped out there was the ability to degrade uh, tau proteins, and in particular mutant tau proteins that are so, or seem to be so involved in neurodegenerative disease. Boris asked if the tau degraders have been profiled in humanized tau mouse models yet, or are we still the step before that? No, they're 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 moving in that um, in that uh, direction. So uh, you know, I think Steve's lab will hopefully have another uh, paper on that pretty uh, uh, pretty soon. Uh, and there's obviously you know all sorts of uh, other um, neuro aggregating uh, proteins that you can go after. So that, that's definitely a really exciting space to watch. And also, people have demonstrated that these protax uh, can get into the CNS. Uh, which I think a lot of people thought w was not going to be possible. But again, it's because some of them are actively transported, uh, and and some of them, you know, have you know quite you know bizarre uh, physical properties. So people have shown you know very effective degradation in in the brain, at least in 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 mice. Excellent. Well, very, very promising research. I think we have probably pushed it about as far as we can get away with now. We've overrun by a couple of minutes. So thank you to everybody for sticking with us for that extra question or two. Uh, as a thank you to everyone who has attended the live broadcast, you will get a certificate in your email in the next few days. Uh, we'll also send you a link to the recording in case there was anything that you wanted to go back and watch again. Um, I have to say an another huge thank you to Millipore Sigma, uh, without whom we wouldn't necessarily have been in touch with Nathaniel in the first place. So thank you for putting us on to a very, very exciting area of, uh, of science and biological and chemical sciences at the moment. And obviously a huge thank you to Nathaniel. Thank you for joining us today. It's been really interesting to hear about your research. And I look forward to seeing more about it. You said there's a paper in the works at the moment. We'll keep an eye out for that one that I'm sure will be out very soon. So thank you again, Nathaniel.
And that's all we have for this Chemistry World webinar. Uh, I'm Ben Fowler, Chemistry World's digital editor. Thank you for joining us. Do keep an eye out in your email inbox for a link to the recording and your certificate by way of saying thank you. And keep an eye on chemistryworld.com slash webinars for more interactive events where we would love to have you in the audience asking those really insightful questions that we've seen today. So thanks again. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's digital editor, and I'll see you for the next Chemistry World webinar.